Everyone's heard of historical myths and historical fallacies, things that didn't really happen or that were completely made up and have turned into conspiracy theories, such as the whole Titanic Olympic swap thing. But one of the biggest historical inaccuracies and biggest historical myths that I personally despise with the passion of a thousand suns is the Dark Ages. Referring to the period between the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the Italian Renaissance as the Dark Ages, it's lazy at best and problematic at worst. It negates the complex societies that existed in Western Europe during this period, and it ignores societies outside of a relatively small bubble encompassing only what was the Western Roman Empire. The term is really just used these days by Roma boos who are obsessed with my pagan Rome best Rome and people who want to blame Christianity for everything. This era, though, included the rise of the Franks under the Carolingian dynasty, providing the building blocks of modern Europe that can be seen today with the beginnings of nations that we know as France, Germany, and Italy, all directly influenced by this time. Similarly, the nation which would conquer most of the known world and spread the English language to become the common lexicon and what you're listening to this video in now was effectively founded in its current form in 1066, following the Battle of Hastings and overthrow of the Saxons, who themselves had birthed the idea of a singular English kingdom during the reign of Alfred the Great. Although changing during the course of the centuries, the United Kingdom and the English language can be directly traced to this period. The so-called Dark Ages were again just a myth in Western Europe, because it negates the fact that the Islamic world rose to prominence, and experienced a golden age of innovation and technological advance for its time period. Similarly, unique and powerful cultures such as that of the Rus began to spread further and further from their homelands in the city of Kiev. These cultures spread religion, technology, and their way of life around the known world. It's frankly stupid to refer to this period when discussing religion with the idea that Christianity merely destroyed everything in its path with regard to pagan culture. This was not a period in which men and women merely existed to please the church and were kept uneducated to be effective feudal slaves as some have claimed. Rather, when examining the cultures such as that of Iceland, it's clear that the rise of the church and its record keeping has allowed the history of Nordic paganism and culture in pre-Christian and pre-Roman worlds to be recorded and analysed. It is an unescapable fact that the reason we know so much about Nordic paganism is because the church wrote it down. But let's look at the Franks, particularly the Carolingians and Charlemagne, who rebuilt the power of Western Europe and halted Islamic conquest, and formed the Holy Roman Empire, which yes, was holy, was Roman, and was an empire. Screw you, Voltaire, and lighten my ass. The Carolingian dynasty and the Frankish Empire, of which they ruled, provided the building blocks of modern Europe and global society through martial, political, and religious means. The rebirth of a strong and martial state in Western Europe following the fall of the Western Roman Empire halted Islamic expansion from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and set the conditions for the spread of the Christian faith deep into Central and Eastern Europe. This rapid expansion of Christendom under the Carolingian sovereigns blossomed a symbiotic relationship with the Papal States, resulting in the Pope's suzerainty of all Catholic rulers in Europe. The power of the church coupled with the martial strength of the Frankish, later Holy Roman Empire, meant that upon its dissolution into multiple kingdoms, unique identities and cultures developed in a unified manner to provide the bedrock of the powerful modern European states that we know today. Western Rome ended in a whimper with the fall of Ravenna in 476 AD, and the final vestiges of Roman power over Gaul, what is now France, were shattered permanently, and all that remained was the weak domain of Soissons. All in all, as TikTok has proven, men tend to think about this event quite often, but in my experience the fall of Rome in the last 200 years is often forgotten or labelled as all Christianity's fault. I personally blame Gibbon for this, as does the biggest me medieval nerd I know, but it is worth noting that the obsession with Rome that many people have these days, it really sort of falls off after Augustus and Caesar. Which is quite sad when you consider it, because Roman history is far, far in my opinion more interesting when you start to get into Commodus and the decline and fall. It was not until the conquest of Soissons by Clovis I of the Franks, founder of the Morovgian dynasty, that the region began to stabilise as a united entity. The Morovgian dynasty was repeatedly divided by Salic law, splitting the kingdom up upon the death of Clovis I and his successors into separate realms. Imagine if when Queen Elizabeth II died, Charles got England, Anne got Scotland, Andy got Northern Ireland, sorry Northern Ireland, and Edward got Wales. I'll go into Salic lore a bit further down into the video, but just for now, keep that in mind. 
Culturally a mess with a populace from multiple backgrounds including Latin Christians, Germanic pagans and local Gaulish people who had survived through the Roman period and kept their way of life. So many more immigrants from the east during the Roman Empire's fall. It was a real mess. And the land was held together effectively through martial forces, more so than culture, religion or people. Think Austria-Hungary from 1914 on steroids. It was not until Pepin the Short, son of legendary Frankish hero Charles Martel, who overthrew the final Morovkian king Childeric III and founded the Carolingian dynasty, that a sense of unity and identity began to develop across the Frankish world, mostly being the Frankish world being Western Europe. This unity was cemented by Charlemagne, who united the kingdom under his authority into one entity and truly began the Christianization of his realm. For the first time, with the exception of the Islamic lands in what is now Spain, with the exception of particularly angsty people in the northwest who don't like to surrender, Central and Western Europe were now united under a single figure and a single religion. The unification rebirthed not only a European identity, but a uniquely Frankish identity, moulding together Latin Christianity, Germanic tradition, and other cultures to form a new kingdom, with the period chronicler Einhard being a primary example of this new combined entity. In his writing, he states, I, who am a barbarian, and very little versed in the Roman language, seem to suppose myself capable of writing gracefully and respectfully in Latin. The dual rise of the Carolingians and the evangelization that came with them began an equally meteoric rise in Western European politics, and another thing that disproves the thought of the Dark Age, but is often latched onto as a way to prove the Dark Age, and that is the rise of the Pope and the Papacy. The historian Baraclet argued in the Crucible of Europe that the most famous of all Carolingian rulers, Charlemagne, did not want to be crowned emperor on Christmas Day, 800 AD. He argued that this action by Pope Leo III was not cementing Frankish dominion of Europe, but papal dominion. Baraclo goes on to state that this action, a severance of ties with Constantinople, the remnant of the Eastern Roman Empire, and alignment of Western European Christians under the Pope of Rome, was a hindrance for the Carolingians, as it put them at odds with the Byzantines. There is a rumour at the time, and it is unsubstantiated, that Charlemagne, upon being crowned Holy Roman Emperor, or Western Emperor, he intended to marry or become entwined with marriage to the Eastern Roman ruler at the time to reform effectively a Roman Empire. It's a rumour, don't read too much into it, somewhat possible, but the Byzantines, um, they're not exactly cognizant to, you know, making smart decisions such as that of an alliance between Holy Roman Western Frankish rule and the Byzantines in the East. They'd much rather fight each other because Byzantine. Whether Baraclo's claim is accurate in regard to the coronation, it does raise the key fact that during the time of Charlemagne and under the Carolingians both before and after his reign, the papacy and the Pope of Rome rose to preeminent power in medieval Europe. The coronation of Charlemagne also reinforced the precedent in Europe when it came to legitimizing power through religion. Not that this wasn't exactly common in ancient Rome, what with Caesar claiming his family came from Venus, but in terms of the Christian world, this really set the precedent. With countries such as the United Kingdom, the monarch is the head of state and the head of the state's dominant religion. And such legitimacy can be claimed through divine right, simply, much, much more simply. This is really important when you compare the coronation of, say, King Charles III, where he was declared defender of the faith, namely the Anglican faith, with the coronation of Charlemagne. This kind of link between a state's religion and legitimacy remains the same throughout multiple Christian countries in Eastern Europe and is indeed the same with other faiths, with the faith of the state being directly linked to the head of the state. The precedent, however, set on Christmas Day 800 AD completely shatters this ideal for the Catholic world in Western Europe. Legitimacy now is given by the Pope, still by God, but through his vicar, described by the Royal Frankish Annals as crowned by God. As such, if the Emperor fell out of favour with the Papacy, the Emperor could, in theory, be replaced. This birth of what can be described as effectively a toxic relationship between the Church and State both cemented papal authority over Western Europe, but also gave divine authority to the new Emperor in the West as the defender of God's chosen Vicar, the Pope. This change set a precedent for how Catholic rulers interacted with and received legitimacy from the Pope, and would not only shape Europe, but also the New World and the Spanish colonies. This is why later on in history, you start to see the Spanish monarchs being referred to as los reales Catholicos, the Catholic monarchs. It's 
really important to understand the relationship between the Pope and the rulers in the West. As rulers of the Frankish Kingdom, later Holy Roman Empire, the Carolingians therefore had not only a vested interest in spreading the Christian faith, but quite literally a God-given duty to check aggression from what would be deemed as heathen forces. Carolingian legitimacy over the Morovians and the entire Frankish peoples was largely built upon the fame and power of Charles Martel and his actions at the pivotal Battle of Tours in 732 AD. The destruction of Umayyad forces at Tours arguably could be considered the greatest impact on the future of Europe caused by the Carolingian dynasty. As following the conquest of Visigothic Spain, the Frankish kingdom remained the only Christian power capable of standing against the Islamic conquest. The destruction of Islamic caliphate forces not only cemented Charles Martel and his dynasty as rulers of the Franks, but it also enshrined the Catholic faith as the faith of Western Europe, and birthed a reliance on the Franks from the papacy itself. I'm not being dramatic here, had the Franks lost at Tor, it is highly possible that the only remaining Christian country in Europe would have been England. France would have come under Islamic rule. And if France came under Islamic rule, good luck stopping them from getting into Rome, good luck saving the Byzantine Empire at that point, which already could barely handle the aggression on its eastern border, having lost the Levant and Egypt. Some decades later, the position of the Franks as the Christian bulwark of Western Europe had not changed, and this is highlighted by the Avar Wars and the Saxon Wars, two conflicts which directly resulted in the expansion of the Frankish realm and the Christianization of what is today countries such as Hungary, Austria, and the Czech Republic, amongst many, many others. Although following the death of Charlemagne's successor, Louis I, yes, that was the first Louis, we get up to like 19, so we'll get there, the empire was split amongst his sons, because of that silly rule was splitting the empire amongst sons, which according to Salic law, when a king died, his territories would be split amongst his heirs. Generally, his natural born legitimate sons or direct male descendants, as was the case upon the death of Charlemagne's father Pepin the Short when the Frankish territories were split between Charlemagne and his younger brother Carloman, who later died. This occurred again upon the death of Charlemagne's sole successor Louis I, with his three sons each receiving a part of the Frankish Empire to rule over independently. This gets a little complicated and becomes a problem once Charlemagne picks up the title of Holy Roman Emperor, as it could not be legally split into three different titles. And so, following the death of Louis I, his eldest son Lothair I, inherited the imperial title with the idea that the three brothers would nominally rule independently but under the emperor. This was not to be the case and almost immediately a giant civil war broke out, shocking, which lasted three years and resulted in the Treaty of Verdun. Said treaty divided the Carolingian Empire permanently and between the three brothers with West Francia becoming the core of what is now modern France, Middle Francia becoming the nucleus of modern Italy and East Francia becoming a distinctly German kingdom, or many German kingdoms. The Holy Roman Empire is a bit of a mess, but the idea is that it's German. The Treaty of Verdun therefore created the base around which the major powers of continental Europe would form, with each state developing relatively independently from this point forward. In time, West Francia would become the powerful kingdom of France. East Francia would itself take on the mantle of Holy Roman Empire under another Carolingian, Otto I. Middle Francia would be dominated to the north of the Alps by its sister kingdoms, eventually losing these lands and instead would later shatter into multiple principalities and city-states, of which the Holy Roman Empire, Papal States and France would trade back and forth for centuries. These states, however, would have a distinct Italian identity and would develop their own unique northern Italian culture and way of life, and this would later be vital in the formation of the modern Italian state which this video, in itself, can be considered a precursor to my future video on how that happened. Whilst the Roman Empire may be considered the first true unified European state, it is without doubt that the Carolingian Empire, taking the mantle from the former Western Roman Empire, formed the bedrock on which modern Europe has developed and been built. The foundation of France, Germany and Italy as independent nations can be traced directly back to the actions resulting from the Treaty of Verdun during the reign of Lothair I and his brother, all of this occurring in an era taught to us moronically as the Dark Age. The Dark Age simply just did not exist, and it's a myth that needs to hurry up and wither and die in the dustbin of lazy and crap history. The Dark Age just saw all of the things we just spoke about. It included the Carolingian Renaissance, it included the Islamic Conquest. There was so much happening in the world during this period. Calling it the Dark Ages 
is doing both yourself a disservice, it's doing the study of history a disservice, and quite frankly, it's moronic and just not true.